Society 13 Podcast Network. Redefining podcasts. Do you like to listen? This episode of History Goes Bump is entirely listener supported. History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spooktacular people. Welcome to this 235th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. On this episode, we are bringing you Manresa Castle, which means we're heading up to the northwest to Washington State. Looking forward to bringing this to everybody. Yes, we are. And this one was suggested by our listener, Jen Morgan. Denise, I just wanted to congratulate you for your 10 years at Disney. We got to have some great fun last week heading out to the Magic Kingdom. And all of you who were celebrating milestone anniversaries got to have the whole park to yourselves. I know it was super, super cool. And that's one thing I can definitely say is my company knows how to throw a party for their cast members. And we knew how to dress for it. Denise had bought a Haunted Mansion dress from one of the Disney shops. And we managed to get a hold of some extra material. And we got mom to make me a vest to match. And then she also made a shirt for me. So we were wearing Haunted Mansion attire at the party. Which was very good because we got to meet the hitchhiking ghost as well as some ghost dancers. Yeah, so we had a lot of fun. And for those of you who are on our Christmas list, you'll be getting a Christmas card that might be featuring some pictures from that event. Who is all on that Christmas list, Diane? Our executive producers, of course. We decided to send out Christmas cards to you guys this year. I've been asking for your mailing addresses. So if you've not already inputted them over at Patreon, please do so or send us a message, an email letting us know what your mailing address is so we can get you out your card. And for those of you who have been donating to us for over a year, because most people average about six months and then they quit, For those of you that have stuck it out and there's a little over 70 of you, you're going to be getting some extra things with your Christmas cards. I was going to say, don't tell them it's a surprise. Oh, I'm not going to tell them what it is. Oh, good. We want to welcome to the Spooktacular crew, Jesse with a Y. Hello, Jesse with a Y. Pam. Hey, Pam. Usi. Hi, Usi. Abby. Hey, Abby. Angel. Hello, Angel. May, who spells her name M-A-E. Hello, May, M-A-E. And Tim. Hi, Tim. And now, this moment in oddity. A skadegamooch is known as a ghost witch. In the lore of the Mi'kmaq, the Passamaquoddy, and the Abenaki tribes, the skadegamooch is an undead monster that is created out of the dead body of an evil magician who refuses to stay dead. This undead creature comes to life at night and lurks about, seeking humans to throw curses at and humans to kill and eat. The only way to stop a ghost witch is to burn it by fire. The following story was told by Beulah Tehamont, a 16-year-old Abenaki from Lake George, New York. An old shaman was dead and his people buried him in a tree up among the branches in a grove that they used for a burial place. Sometime after this, in the winter, a Native American and his wife came along looking for a good place to spend the night. They saw the grove, went in, and built their cooking fire. When their supper was over, the woman, looking up, saw long dark things hanging among the tree branches. What are they, she asked. They are only the dead of long ago, said her husband. I want to sleep. I don't like it at all. I think we'd better sit up all night, replied his wife. The man would not listen to her, but went to sleep. Soon the fire went out, and then she began to hear a gnawing sound like an animal with a bone. She sat still, very much scared, all night long. About dawn, she could stand it no longer, and reaching out, tried to wake her husband, but could not. She thought him sound asleep. The gnawing had stopped. When daylight came, she went to her husband and found him dead, with his left side gnawed away and his heart gone. She turned and ran. 
At last she came to a lodge where there were some people. Here she told her story, but they would not believe it, thinking that she had killed the man herself. They went with her to the place, however. There they found the man with his heart gone, lying under the burial tree with the dead witch right overhead. They took the body down and unwrapped it. The mouth and face were covered with fresh blood. The legend of the Scuddy Gamooch certainly is odd. Are you afraid of the dark? That's just silly. What you should be afraid of is the thing that watches you sleep. <laughs> and now, this month in history. In the month of December, on the 1st in 1919, Lady Nancy Astor became the first woman in the British House of Commons. She was born as Nancy Lahorn in Virginia. She married her first husband in 1897 at the age of 18. The marriage was an unhappy one due to her husband's alcoholism, and she divorced him after four years. She went on a tour of England and fell in love with the country, and so she decided to move to England. Nancy was 26 at the time. She met Waldorf Astor there and the two married. They were very similar people and even shared the exact same birthday, including the year, and both were expatriates. Waldorf succeeded to the peerage and became part of the House of Lords. Nancy became interested in politics at this time, and in 1919, she won his former seat in Plymouth as a member of the Conservative Party. She then became the first woman to sit as a member of Parliament in the House of Commons. She served until 1945 when she was persuaded to step down. Port Townsend claims to be one of the coolest small towns in America. The city had its heyday during the Victorian era, and several of the historic buildings here are Victorian in design. Many of the earlier settlers envisioned the seaport becoming the largest harbor on the West Coast. One of the prominent families in Port Townsend were the Eisenbises, and they built their home in 1892 in the style of a castle that is today known as Manresa Castle. This is a hotel, restaurant, and lounge that not only provides accommodations for the living, but a couple of ghosts as well. Join us as we explore the history and hauntings of Manresa Castle. In 1791, British Royal Navy Captain George Vancouver led an expedition from England with two ships, the Discovery and Chatham. The plan was to explore the northwest coast of North America. By May 1792, Vancouver's expedition had entered the Strait of Juan de Fuca and was exploring the northern side of the Olympic Peninsula. Captain Vancouver made it a practice to name the points that they mapped out on their journey for his friends, patrons, and crew members. One of the places he named was Port Townsend, which was named for the Marquis of Townsend. The name was originally spelled ending with S-H-E-N-D, but today the H has been dropped. Before the Europeans arrived, several tribes lived here. The Chemakam, Hoa, who were a group of the Quilute, Klalam, Quinault, and Twana. And I know I probably butchered all of those. Port Townsend was called the City of Dreams because it was considered a safe harbor with the promise of being the largest harbor on the west coast of the United States. It did become a very active seaport. Port Townsend was founded as a city in the 1850s. Four men, Alfred A. Plummer, Lauren B. Hastings, Charles Batchelder, and Francis W. Pettigrove met in a cabin that two of them had built on the beach below Point Hudson, and they agreed to establish the town together and name it for Port Townsend. Soon thereafter, the town became the site of the U.S. Customs Port of Entry and the county seat of Jefferson County. Many homes were erected at this time as the population grew and railroads decided to add an extension of rail lines to the seaport. Those plans fell through, though, when the Depression hit and the rail line stopped on the east end of the Puget Sound. The decline for Port Townsend was rapid as people moved away. Other economies developed in the future with the installation of a paper mill and the naval magazine Indian Island, which is the U.S. Navy's primary munitions handling dock on the Pacific coast. More people started moving here in the 1970s and Port Townsend has developed into a tourist destination. They host blues and jazz festivals, and in 1999, they launched an annual international film festival. Many people come to the town to see all of the Victorian architecture. 
Because so much of the town was abandoned and the economy was dying, no one tore down any of the buildings and built over the sites. So in essence, the Victorian buildings were preserved because of a lack of growth. Today, many have been restored as their value is appreciated. One of these grand structures is the Manresa Castle. The castle was built in 1892 by Charles and Kate Eisenbeis. Charles Eisenbeis was a German immigrant who arrived in Rochester, New York in 1856. He learned baking from his family and worked doing that for a while. The gold rush was reaching a peak on the West Coast and Charles decided to head west. He boarded a ship that sailed around Cape Horn heading for Puget Sound. The weather was rough when they arrived at the Sound and the ship decided to dock at Port Townsend. The year is 1858 and this is where Charles decides to stay. His brother was traveling with him and the two men did odd jobs saving up money to open their own bakery. They called it the Pioneer Bakery, and they specialized in making bread for ships. The business was very successful, and he became a very prominent man. So prominent that he became part of the Big Five Syndicate, which was five men that controlled the entire economy of Port Townsend. When Charles first arrived in Port Townsend, he was married to a woman from Prussia named Elizabeth. She died in 1882, and he remarried a woman named Kate. Twenty years after arriving in the town, Charles was elected the town's first mayor. He built several properties in Port Townsend, the Mount Baker Block, the Eisenbeis Building, a hotel, a brickyard, lumberyard, a brewery, and the Eisenbeis Castle that was his home. So that was the original name of Manrisa Castle. The hotel was a grand structure with 120 rooms, but it never opened as the promise of the coming railroad was never realized. So what they'd done is made it so a lot of the rooms were overlooking the railroad. I don't know if that was going to be like a attraction for people to see. But since the railroad never came, not only was there nothing for them to look at, but it wasn't bringing all the people into town to fill up those 120 rooms. It burned down in a fire of mysterious origin. So I don't know if somebody had it burned down for insurance purposes or if it just happened to burn down, but it's gone. The Eisenbeis Castle was the largest residence in Port Townsend at the time and had 30 rooms. The home was constructed from brick and had a slate roof. The inside was designed and built by German artisans and featured finely crafted woodwork and tiled fireplaces. He didn't get to enjoy his home for long. Charles died in 1902. How many times do we hear that these guys build these huge mansions for themselves and they die shortly? It's kind of like those guys who retire from work and then they have a heart attack. I know. It's just because that story comes up time and time again when we do the research. He was buried in nearby Laurel Grove Cemetery. The whole town turned out to see his burial. His casket is within a subterranean vault and was placed next to the Victorian glass top coffin of his first wife, Elizabeth. And we do have a picture in the notes of their vault. It's pretty cool looking. But there is an interesting story connected to the burial. The vault was sealed for many years. The sandstone slab cracked and fell into the vault many years later, and it was open for repairs. Unfortunately, the slab fell in on Elizabeth's coffin and broke the glass. Another coffin was damaged as well. This one was a child's coffin that was on top of Charles's casket. The managers of the graveyard were befuddled. There should be no other coffin in the vault because there was no record of it. The great-grandchildren of Charles, Anne and Mayor Mark Welsh, were called. None of us knew anything about it, Anne Welch said. The child's casket was a complete surprise. Plaques with the names of the other family members are embedded in the solid cement around the white Victorian cenotaph and indicate where the ashes of Eisenbeis' descendants were buried around the perimeter. Some other descendants were buried in the upper part of the cemetery. So who is this child? The child is buried in a coffin with a glass lid as well, which seems to indicate that she does belong in this vault. But why no indication as to who she was? Was she illegitimate? It remains a mystery. That's the main suggestion that they put out there. They think that possibly she was illegitimate for some reason. So who knows? Or maybe it was a child that he and Elizabeth had had and nobody knew that she was put in there. I'm, I'm not sure why they would not have a record of who this was. Or maybe since she was a child, it just wasn't important to them. I'm not sure. Well, that would be quite shocking to go fix a vault that's supposed to have one thing in it and then find this little casket that appears to belong there, but there's no record of why. That would be so strange. And I don't know what the inside of the vault looks like, but it's rather large on the outside, so I'm not sure why they had to put it on top of his. And of course, that makes you wonder, was it already in there, and then they picked it up and put it on top of his when they put him in there? Did she die later, and they put her in on top of her father? Who knows? The idea of a glass lid on a coffin? I know why. I mean, I wouldn't want to see 
I mean, I guess right after it'd be kind of nice for viewing. You know, you don't have to open the casket. You could just look through the glass. But I would think you wouldn't want to have that glass uncovered then as they're decaying and that kind of thing. I wonder if that was just maybe something that was very common, because if you think about the story of Snow White, she was in a glass casket, too. Well, that's true. Huh. Kate remarried in 1905. This is his second wife, and she abandoned the castle to a caretaker who was the only one to live there for 20 years. So I don't know if she just didn't want to live in this big mansion anymore or what, but she just left it, said, bye, you take care of it. In 1925, a Seattle attorney bought the castle and turned it over to some nuns who were teaching in Seattle schools so they could use it as a vacation home. The nuns didn't use it much, and so some Jesuit priests moved in in 1927, and they used it as a training college. What happened is the Jesuit priests would get to their 16th and final year of training, so I guess it takes you 16 years to become a Jesuit, and this is where they would study that 16th year, which was aesthetic theology. The Jesuits added a large wing housing a chapel and more rooms in 1928 and installed an Otis elevator. The outer bricks were stuccoed over to give the building a uniform look, and they called the building Manresa Hall after a town in Spain where Ignatius Loyola had founded the Jesuit order. And so this explained a lot to me because when I was doing the research and looking at how this was built and it said that they had built it out of bricks. And of course, these were bricks that Charles himself supplied because he had the brickyard. I was like, okay, well, this doesn't have a brick outside. I mean, it looks like it's stuccoed and solid. Well, now we know why, because the Jesuits stuccoed the whole thing, probably because the addition that they added didn't look like the rest of it and look kind of funny. So then they made it all look the same. So it doesn't have a brick outer look to it anymore, which makes it even more castle like. The Jesuits left in 1968, and the building became a hotel with the new name changing to Manresa Castle, taking inspiration from the original home and the name the Jesuits used. Three other owners have held the building since 1968. Each has done renovations and brought the hotel up to modern standards. The Victorian elegance has been kept, though. Some of those modern amenities include more bathrooms. There were only three during the Jesuits' time, and now there are 43. I guess modern people have to go potty more than Jesuits. Well, and when you get a room, you pretty much don't want to share one bathroom with a whole bunch of people. So I guess that makes sense. The Castle Key Seafood Restaurant has been added and offers the best in Northwest recipes and is open Tuesday to Sunday. There's a banquet room, several suites, and romantic gardens, making it the perfect setting for weddings. Another unique feature of Manresa Castle is, of course, the ghost. Now, according to all of the experiences that we heard about out there, there seem to be three rooms that are haunted, and they're all on the third floor for some reason. These are rooms 302, 304, and 306, and they're home to two different ghosts. One is a young lady thought to be named Kate, and this is not his wife, Kate. This is some other woman named Kate, and I'm not sure how they got her name. But she's said to be waiting for her beloved to come back to her after he was fighting in a war. He was killed in the war, so he couldn't come back to her. And when she heard about that, she threw herself out of the window. The other ghost belongs to a Jesuit monk who hung himself in the attic. Apparently, he was very despondent or depressed about something. I'm not sure why. And so he hung himself up there. Haunting events feature footsteps walking across the attic when no one is up there. Drinking glasses in the cafe, which used to be the chapel, explode both when just sitting on the bar and also in people's hands. So I'm not sure how that's happening. If it's in your actual hand and then it explodes. Yikes. Because you could see maybe if it's sitting on the bar and I don't know what ghosts can do or what kind of pressure they could put on something, but it just seems weird that they could do it when it's in your hand. Empty glasses are also turned upside down on their own. People claim to see writing on the mirrors with messages like, of course, our standard get out. And the full-bodied apparition of the female ghost has been seen many times. What they do here is what they do in a lot of other hotels. They have journals in the rooms where people can record their experiences. And you could check out those journals at the front desk sometimes or in the actual room that you're staying in. That would be kind of cool. Of course, I don't know that I would sleep much that night, but it'd be kind of fun to read. It would be fun to read. One of the entries in the journal related, At midnight, we heard singing coming from the bathroom. It was a woman's voice singing a ghostly tune. Well, needless to say, we all woke up. If we had known she was coming at midnight, we would have stayed up and waited on her. I got up to go to the bathroom to see who was in there, and then the door eerily came open. There was a swish of cold air and a glowing light, and then all the lights came on. After that, we saw nothing else. We didn't get much sleep for the rest of the night. 
That one to me almost seems like it's residual, like she was in there getting ready and singing to herself while she was doing that and then coming out of the bathroom when you're getting that swish of cold air. One family shared the following experience that they had. The next morning, James, who was 13, went down to use the restroom down the hall. This was the room 303 bathroom and came back concerned that he heard a woman crying mournfully in the 305 bathroom. But the lights were out in that room. He brought his dad down the hall to show him and he heard it also. I, Lori, then went down there, but by the time I got there, she was no longer crying. I did, however, hear movement coming from inside the room. When I knocked on the door and asked if someone needed help, the response was two knocks back from whoever was in there. Now, of course, if this is legitimate, you're thinking, I better go get some help because obviously they can't call out. They're knocking on the door to let me know we need help. Right. So at this point, we decided to call the front desk to tell them what was going on. They sent up four maids to check the situation out. Don't you love it? You don't have the manager coming. Send the maids. <laughs> of course, the hotel knows that they have these hauntings going on. So that's probably why. And you've got to think, did they send the four maids or did the four maids all look at each other and go, I'm not going. You're going with me. And they're right. like, we better all go together. When they opened the door, it was dark inside and no one was in there. But the maid commented that someone had sure been into the Kleenex. It was strewn about. Lori, when she wrote this entry, wanted to make note that the door was never left unattended the whole time of their experience. So it wasn't like somebody could sneak in there and throw a bunch of Kleenexes around or somebody could have left. Another family wrote, finally, around 1130 p.m., we started hearing things. Earlier, we were looking forward to hearing things. But when we actually did hear things, we were huddled with blankets to our noses. That's what you get for tempting the spirits. (laughs) Uh, That's what I'm saying. There wasn't really anything in the room. It was in the hallway. Definite draggings and walking sounds. They would stop right at the door. It was so scary. Then scratching and scraping sounds at the door. It was like someone was right on the other side and would open or come through the door. This all went on for about an hour and a half. Now, what I don't understand is, I mean, why wouldn't you go and at least look out? I I don't know if these doors have keyholes or and kind of look out there. I don't know. For an hour and a half, I think I'd be like, okay, is somebody messing with me? I don't know that somebody would mess with you for that long a period of time, though. But the scratching on the door would kind of do me in because that's just not only is it like having nails on a chalkboard, but that would creep me out because it's like, why are they trying to scratch their way in? Manresa Castle has such a haunting reputation that it actually has made it onto an episode of Ghost Adventures. They visited the hotel during their 11th season. And I did watch this one. And I don't know, this place has some really freaky stuff that's going on there and some freaky rooms and such. So Jody Ruther is the front desk manager. She claims that she was a non-believer when she first started working at Manresa Castle, as so many people out there are until they start having their own experiences. She's had enough experiences at this point that she says she believes in ghosts and she believes that there are definitely ghosts there. One day she was making up the bed in room 310 with a housekeeper. Apparently there was nobody staying in the hotel at the time. So what she'd done is she'd locked the front door to make sure nobody could come in while they were going to be busy getting the rooms together. So she's helping the housekeeper make the bed. The door to the room is open. She's got her back to that open doorway, but the housekeeper can see out. And she looks up at the housekeeper while they're making the bed because she notices that she stopped doing what she's doing. And the maid or housekeeper has her eyes are just huge. She's obviously scared of something that she's seeing behind Jody. This is not something you ever want to have happen to you to look up and have somebody looking in terror at something behind you. So Jody spins around and she sees something, some kind of figure go past the open door or whatever was standing in the open door turned away and walked away. So she runs out into the hallway to see who this is because there shouldn't be anybody in the hotel with them. And she notices right away that the woman is in period clothing. She also noticed that she could see the fire escape through the woman. So this is clearly not a human being. Then the woman just disappears. Now they have this room called the breakfast room. It seems to be down on the lowest level, maybe even down in the basement. It's very dark down there. So it looks kind of like a comfortable, cozy little setting until you know that the place is haunted. And so it looks really creepy when you know the place is haunted. There seems to be a lot of activity going on in here. When I saw all these other claims about these three rooms that are haunted, I'm like, well, this isn't one of those rooms. So there's hauntings going on in other parts of the building. And based on some of the other haunting experiences that we heard, it makes me think there's more than two ghosts here. Well, what happened is Zach goes around and interviews you know, takes a tour of the locations and interviews the person, kind of gets a feel for what's going on. 
Occasionally stuff happens while they're doing the interviews and they'll stop everything that they're doing and start doing some investigation. So he and Jody are down in this breakfast room and she's telling him a little bit about how the glasses go flying and lights come on and off. All of a sudden they hear this click and a door open. And Zach could kind of see it out of the corner of his eye. He goes, that door over there just opened. So, of course, they all go running over there. They're looking on both sides. They start trying to debunk it, seeing if there's kind of a draft there. They're jumping to see if the door opens. One of the guys that he has with him, I think it was Aaron, he had him hold a towel near it to see if there was a draft. And right when Aaron starts holding the towel next to the doorknob, the door clicks open and opens again. And he's like, okay, well, there's no draft because the towel didn't move at all. So it was kind of weird. He also talked to Mardella, who's a housekeeper there, and she had a violent experience in the laundry room, which is in the bottom floor. She was left with a small handprint bruise on her leg, but she did not feel anything touch her. So what had happened is she goes home that night, she's taking off her clothes, and she's looking at her leg, and she's like, what in the world? I have a handprint on my body, but she never felt anything hit her. Wow. So the next day, she goes back into work, and she's decided, I'm going to tell whatever this is don't touch me. You are not allowed to touch me. Leave me alone. So she says this to the ghost out loud while she's down there in the laundry room and she wants to be left alone. Then something unseen punched her very hard in the face. And when she said punched very hard, Zach goes, well, can you punch me to show me how hard it was? And she goes, I can't punch somebody that hard. Oh, geez. There seems to be unexplained activity in this hotel. While there are claims that there are only two ghosts, is it possible that there might be more? And are these ghosts or just the products of overactive imaginations? Is Manresa Castle haunted? That is for you to decide. Sounds like a place for us to check out in Washington. Yes, it does. It's a really cool looking building. I I just love anything that looks like a castle. I just love. I love the look of castles. And I would love to see all the Victorian buildings that they have in this uh, Port Townsend. Well, we'd love to have you guys check out our website at historyghostbump.com. And Denise, if people want to send us some feedback, where can they do that? They can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. We did get an email from Lucy. Dear Diane and Denise, this is Lucy, your eight-year-old listener, number one fan. Ooh, we have a number one fan. There might be some competition there, but uh, is Lucy the youngest we've heard from? Eight? I think so. I think so. And she also suggested a location in Salem. I would also like to tell you that we went to the Dia de los Muertos at Hollywood Forever Cemetery a couple times, and I know that you've mentioned that on a previous Haunted Cemeteries episode. It was bright and colorful and cheerful. The things people made for their friends and family were so nice, and I can tell a lot of them had very hard work put into them. I saw that you made a Calico episode. I just want to say that we've been there but didn't experience anything, although it was a little creaky and weird. I like your show. I rate it a five stars. I listen to it almost every day. Thanks for your wonderful show. Keep it going from Lucy. Well, thank you, Lucy. We appreciate that. Yes, we do. Thank you for listening. And we also got another email from Carly. I also wanted to share a quick story with you. On Thanksgiving, my aunt asked me for a podcast recommendation. Naturally, I suggested History Goes Bump. So we decided to listen to an episode as a family, and we just so happened to be having Thanksgiving at my grandparents' house in the Pine Barrens, also known as the home of the New Jersey Devil. They live only a few miles away from where he supposedly lived. So we gathered around the campfire, toasted some marshmallows, and listened to the HGB New Jersey Devil episode. Thanks for helping me create a new family tradition. Oh, that's cool. I love that tradition. That's very cool, yes. And speaking of traditions, one of our listeners, Jen, let us know in the Spooktacular crew that Galveston, Texas celebrates Dickens on the Strand. And she shared a picture of her wearing a costume of a suffragist and she's standing with the ghost of Christmas past. Looks like a really fun celebration. And that made me wonder how many other people out there have Dickens inspired celebrations around their towns at this time of the year. It's very cool. Kathy, one of our moderators, visited the Magnolia Hotel in Seguin, Texas, and she said it was a lot of fun. They had a good time. I don't think she had any experiences, but they sell some of the things that they found in the home in the gift shop, and so she bought herself a vase in there. And apparently, it's getting fairly close to being fully restored. The upstairs still has some work to go, but definitely need to check that out. I know we drove past the turnoff for Seguin. We just didn't go to Seguin. 
And Sabrina shared in the Spooktacular crew this really cool story. Hey, all, I wanted to share an experience from the other day. Probably a weird coincidence, but I know this crew can appreciate it. I was early for work the other day and eating some lunch in my car while listening to HGB. I was wearing my grandmother's jacket, my grandmother who passed away in the spring of this past year. As I was eating my sandwich, I had some of the dressing drip down onto my chest, which is something that my grandmother was notorious for. She was a very classy lady, but it seems to be a family trait because all of her shirts and jackets had stains from her dripping her food, and my mom does it, and clearly, I do it too. We all lovingly tease each other for it, and I was reminiscing and laughing at myself for eating like my grandmother while wearing her jacket like I was living on her legacy, when all of a sudden, the volume on my radio went all the way up. It really startled me, and in the past four years of owning this car, it had never done that. I know that with electronics, anything can be explained away pretty easily, but it was strange. The other coincidence of this experience is that in the episode I was listening to, you were discussing the Great Chicago Fire. My grandmother was a very involved Chicago historian, being involved with the Chicago Historical Society and as the president of the Historical Society for her own Chicago neighborhood. I'm sure it can easily be explained away as coincidence, but I just love to think about my grandma coming back to say hi. And I know this is the kind of group who can appreciate that too. Thanks for letting me share. And so what I want to know is, did the volume go up because she was saying hi and that she was there? Or did we say something that was not correct since she was a Chicago historian and she was like, whoa, no. Or was she saying yes, right on? Well, what I said I thought happened is grandma's a fan of the podcast and we were talking about something that she was very interested in and knew a thing or two about. And here you've got Sabrina cackling about dripping dressing on herself. It's kind of hard to hear over somebody who's laughing. So she had to turn up the volume so she could hear over Sabrina's laughing. Ah, that's a good one. That's what I said happened. Okay, I'll go with your, your theory. I don't think it was a coincidence. I've never in my whole life ever had a car radio have the volume go all the way to the full. Just on its own. I have either. Nope. Just when you're in there and you like a song. (laughs) Yeah, but I mean, if there's nobody (laughs) else doing it. Yeah. We also want to let y'all know that we have started the contest for our exclusive design for t shirts for 2018. Every year, we ask those of you out there in our listenership who are a bit artistic to come up with a special design that's available for the following year and for after that time as well. Every year, we always ask for there to be three elements in the design. There always has to be a ghost, and there always has to be the words history goes bump, and then Denise comes up with what that third piece of the design is going to be. The first year, it was a palm tree. Last year, it was a castle. So Denise, this year, there's supposed to be history goes bump, a ghost, and what is the third element? A lighthouse. One of Denise's favorite things, a lighthouse. So you need to have those three things in the design. You can add anything else you want. And you can have more than one ghost, too, if you want. Absolutely. Just as long as it has those three. Your submissions need to be to us by midnight Eastern time on December 23rd, 2017. You send them to historyghostbump at gmail.com. You can save it in whatever format, PNG, JPG. We ask that you do it fairly large, about 1,500 by 1,500 pixels. That way it is easier to shrink down and it doesn't lose a lot of its detail. If you can't do that, that's fine. We try to work around it however we can. And even though you may not be the winner, that doesn't mean that your t-shirt design may not come up later. Matt Hazley made a design back in 2015. He wasn't a winner, but that design is going to be a part of our Key West trip 2018 t-shirts. Yes. And speaking of that trip, one week after the design contest is due, your registration and deposit are due for the Key West trip. I want to say here, I did put it in on the event page, but we did find out that we do not have to pay for the dry tortugas portion of the trip at registration, which was really nice because that was $180. So that one we have a month or so wiggle space on. So all I need is your deposit of $100 and your registration form in order to hold your spot on the trip, which is going to take place on Friday, July 13th through the 16th in 2018. And they do want to book their hotel before the end of December, right, Denise? That is correct. Our hotel block is being held. And to get any extra details or to get all the information, just check out the website at historyghostbump.com and look at the Key West tab. We do have some reviews from Apple Podcasts. The first one is from Babbitt 9172 I really enjoy this show. Five stars. Very interesting and well done. Thank you, Babbitt. Carmilla D. It's so good. I had to share. Five stars. I love this podcast. It's so good. I had to share it with my mom. We both love history and hauntings. Mom likes the podcast too. Yay. All right. Well, thank you, Carmilla. Thanks for sharing us. 
and Shameless OK. Awesome. Five stars. Very interesting topics to explore. Thank you for that. If you have not left us a review over on iTunes and you are able to do that, we sure would love to have those. Maybe a little extra Christmas present for us. We sure would be appreciative of that. I want to thank you guys for listening to this episode. I have been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. Thanks. Sweet dreams. 